Without further ado, let me introduce our second guest today. He needs little introduction. He's the managing director of brand Iceland Foods. Good morning, Richard Walker. Good morning, Richard. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, very well. Good to see you, bright and breezy. I, I um, are you at home at work? This no, morning? I'm in the office. In the office. As a key yeah. worker, you know, we've we've been busy feeding the nation over the last couple of months. So, um, we our head office here on on Deeside Industrial Estate. Normally, we have about 850 people. Um, yeah. It's skeleton down to to about uh, 50 or so, right in the middle of the uh, the lockdown. Um, but we're we're starting to kind of have a, a bit of a fuller team back in the office now. Well, I'd, I'd like to actually start there, Richard, if it's all right. I'm just going to really cut into it because um, I'm fascinated by what you're doing. But we've got limited time this morning and I've got questions from the audience I want to get in as well. In a way, you must have experienced something approaching hyper growth during the pandemic and the lockdown, incredibly serious times. But what is the number one thing you learned or that you think you will keep as a change in the wake of everything that's happened? Well, we've learned a lot. You know, we, we were sideblinded really by this unprecedented panic buying um, in, in March, which seems like a lifetime ago now. So our just-in-time supply chains, the whole industries were very challenged. And that's why we saw empty shelves uh, for a couple of weeks until until our supply chains um, uh, caught up. And, and I think that has taught us a few things about uh, how robust our, our stock holding and supply chains are. And it is probably you know, made the food industry question as well, just how segregated it is. And it was interesting to see that when restaurants and wholesalers were closed, uh, they were un unable to switch that food supply to retail, which which seems bizarre. You know, the fact that you've got strawberries that would have gone to Wimbledon now rotting. So I think if, if we're looking at a more robust, flexible, diverse food system, we need to, um, we need to consider how to sort of uh, join the dots a bit more across retail and wholesale. And, and what about as a leader? Um, you have over 900 stores, over 40 stores across Europe, beyond the UK. What, what was the number one lesson you learned? I think uh, tr trusting our, our staff, as always, who, who have been absolutely heroic. But the, um, it, the, the whole episode just underlines the fact that they're in the driving seat. They uh, are, are embedded in the hearts of the communities that we serve around the UK, and they have the best ideas. And a lot of the things that, that we did, such as um, being the first retailer to introduce the elderly hour for, for elderly and the vulnerable, um, lots of different things in terms of age, UK donation, et cetera, they were all ideas that were generated from the stores. Uh, yeah. So just having that communication flow upwards from the stores, hearing their ideas is, is so important, especially when you're reacting to uh, the, these unprecedented times like we've had to. Yeah, well, I'm sure we'll return to that in our questions as well. Richard, you've made some uh, or set some very ambitious goals for the business with regard to plastic. Just remind us what they are and tell us how you're getting on. And then we'll unpick the how uh, to share with our guests this morning. Yeah, the how's the tricky bit. Um, so we two years ago, we announced that we, we wanted to become the first retailer anywhere in the world to fully eliminate plastic from our own label. 2023. Very ambitious goal. Like I said, uh, the, the first re retailer to announce that. And actually, whilst there's been a, a raft of commitments from our competitors since about reducing single use, uh, which is all, all hugely welcomed, we're still the only one to have such an extreme goal um, uh, that we've set on, on plastic. Uh, but we're determined to get there. We do have a, a bit of a natural advantage in that we're a, a privately owned, uh, fully family owned business. Uh, and therefore, we can take a long term view and taper in the, the costs over the long term. Obviously, we're frozen specialists and, and therefore you need less packaging anyway in the frozen chamber. Um, but we've, we've made really good progress. We've just announced that we, uh, since we announced in 2018, we've reduced it by 29 percent. So that's an absolute you know, monumental effort. And that, you know, hats off to our packaging teams, our buying teams and our suppliers who've delivered mm -hmm. on that. Obviously, we're not going to stop there. And we're determined to get to the end goal. So we've got trials and tests happening every single week uh, to try to try and hit this this ambitious target. So so you've reduced almost what thirty percent already. Yeah. yeah. So, so where are the big blockers then? What are you going to need to get out of the way? And what have you already learned about getting people on side? There's, do you know there's blockers at every turn because plastic is a is a miracle uh, material. It's absolutely fantastic. It's just that the supermarket industry has got lazy and addicted 
to our use of it. And it's become ubiquitous. And we seem to bag it and wrap it and coat it in everything. And that's because it's cheaper than anything else. And it lasts forever, which we're now learning is, is part of the problem. Uh, therefore, we're, we're coming up with alternate solutions which are cost neutral for our customers, hugely important. You know, we say we're trying to democratize sustainability and some of our customers might only have £25 a week to spend on food. And therefore, whilst, you know, environmental concerns are important to them, they can't necessarily afford to pay more to make ethical choices. Uh, therefore, we're trying to do it cost neutrally as well. Um, big wins have come on, you know, our ready meal trays, for example, which was a fairly easy switch out of black plastic into wooden board sustainable trays. Uh, yeah. But the harder categories are some of the um, fresh um, bacon fruit, uh, sorry, uh, uh, preserved bacon, for example, in our chilled section, um, mm. gas, gas flushed and very difficult to find a replacement material. But we're, we're working hard on it. OK, so two quick fire questions. One. When you push this agenda forward, for example, removing plastic from loose vegetables in the veg section, and you see the sales go down, as I believe you did when you first piloted that, your FD's not happy, your colleagues are feeling stressed. No one's happy. <laughs> well, so, so, so how do you not give up and go, all right, we'll take a step back then? Well, first of all, you have to recognise that it wasn't sustainable. And the true definition of sustainable isn't just something that's good for the planet. It's got to be something that my customers want, and it's got to work for the business as well, because 25,000 jobs survive, uh, depend on us doing well. Uh, and therefore, you, you learn the lessons, you move on. So you're right, selling loose uh, veg didn't work, and therefore we iterated, and we had a new trial where we wrapped some of our, our veg in, um, in uh, board material, paper material, and actually that did work. And in some instances, sales went up because the packaging looks fabulous. So we learned that our customers love pre-packaged convenience. It's then just delivering that, not in a plastic format. Okay, well, I, well, I, I wish we had longer on all of this. I, I am drawn by that, what our customers want. That presumably doesn't always mean what they've asked for, but you have to be convinced they'll like, because I'm just very interested in how you effectively take the customer on a journey here, because they're not always calling out for the thing you're about to introduce, are they, or are they? No, they're not. And, and Iceland has a long, proud history of corporate campaigning. You know, my, my mum and dad started the business 50 years ago this year, and uh, dad has picked up the mantle on many, many campaigns over the years that our customers weren't necessarily crying out for. We became the first retailer in the world to ban genetically modified ingredients uh, in the early noughties. Uh, but actually, once we explained that to our customers, they were absolutely on side and didn't want Frankenstein foods in their products. The same with plastics. We undertook a survey and over 80% of them said that they would choose to avoid plastic. Um, but it's got to be, you know, products that they want at the right price. Very important. And um, I am very tempted, Richard, to ask you a personal question about what your father, the founder of the business, made of those very bold goals. Um, sometimes we can... Um, generalize about how different generations see the future of the planet but i hope you don't mind going there no um i you know he's he's a businessman first and an entrepreneur first and quite rightly uh doesn't want anything to jeopardize the uh the long-term health of the of the business and therefore whatever we do it's got to be right for the shops and right for the customers yeah. uh, so obviously he's, he's proud of our commitments and our action on things like palm oil and things like plastics um, mindful of the fact that you know we're facing into multi-million pounds worth of costs that we're having to taper in. Um, but ultimately, you know, I, I know he knows it's the right thing. There is, I might add, an added benefit, and this is where we were ahead of the curve. Since our announcement last year, the government introduced a plastic tax, and retailers like myself are now facing into literally tens of millions of extra cost yeah. should they stick with plastic. And therefore, there's a cold hard-nosed business reason for wanting to get out of plastic now as well. So right. even the FD is on board. X, good. So on that, I'm going to give you a, a cold, hard-nosed um, view, which is what, what, what's the preoccupation with being first? Um, you know, you're not the largest, you're not the wealthiest, and yet wouldn't it have been easier to wait for someone else to go first? You could have learned from all their mistakes and uh, had an easier ride. So why don't you do that? Yeah, you're right. And, and it's picking and choosing when it's best to lead and disrupt. And as I said, Iceland has a proud history of that. Uh, and when it's best to follow. And because, yeah, you know, we're a big business, our sales are almost four billion pounds a year, but 
Um, because we're only two and a half percent of the market, we can't lead on everything. I'd love to solve the issue of, of soy, which is causing deforestation in the Amazon and the Cerrado, but you know, little old Iceland in the global context just cannot do that. Um, I'd love to be the first on carbon commitments, and we're making big progress. We, we've got an announcement next week on it, but um, you know, we, we can't lead on that. So it's just knowing your business, knowing your customer, knowing where to disrupt and knowing where to follow. Really interesting. So well, where do you, um, well, actually, no, I, I want to get more on the how just very briefly. G give me a piece of advice for really getting the whole organization on board when it comes to this sustainability agenda. Um, obviously, like your father, like yourself, they want to know that they're going to have a paycheck at the end of the month. Um, they don't want to see anyone taking risks with the business, but you know, you, you've got to keep them on the journey. Yeah, you have. And I think I've learned these lessons over the last couple of years as well. You cannot do it in a silo. It cannot be one man or one woman's mission. Um, it has to be something that's embedded throughout the business. And actually, surprisingly, we don't have a sustainability department. Uh, Tesco have 50 people, m and have 20. People ask, how big is yours? And I say, well, it's 25,000, actually, because, you know, all of our colleagues are damn proud of what we're doing and the part they played. Um, so, you know, it's just having that communication throughout the business and making sure that everyone knows they have a role to play in delivering it. Can you give, um, Richard, thank you. I'm going to bring Blondine in momentarily, but just briefly, can you give me another practical tip on that non siloization on involving everybody, the 25,000 person sustainability department? Give me something practical that we can take away and use. Yeah, I think it's communication. So uh, you've asked for the how, but you deliver the how by giving the why. And I think, you know, um, explaining to people exactly why we're doing this and being proud of the fact that Iceland are taking these steps is so important to get people's buy in, because ultimately, you know, people will be managed by someone imposed above them, but they'll lead and follow someone that they, they want to. Uh, and that, that comes from, you know, uh, selling them the, uh, the sustainability dream, if you like, which often too often is had in, in silos and behind closed doors.